Okay, let's uh, start this afternoon session. We start with an introduction to Julia, another language for um, data analysis by Tamash. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So yeah, let's uh, dive in. Uh, this is the Julia talk. A few people were already curious about my comparisons to Julia when I did my Python talks and NumPy talks, etc. So. Here we go. This will be a very short uh, introduction to the language itself. And then we do some live demos so it, that you can see the language in action. And uh, yeah, I would like to start with my first slide. So what is Julia? Let's dive in directly. So Julia, um, by the way, you can download it on the site if you want to follow along uh, any kind of, um, of um, demos I'm doing. But uh, the better is to just uh, sit back and watch. Um, it's a high-level and uh, high-performance dynamic programming language and specifically designed for science and numerical computing. So it's basically all you need for, for science, I would say. Uh, it's a multi-paradigm language um, which combines different uh, styles of programming or different paradigms of, of programming languages like procedural, functional, meta, and even object-oriented programming. But its main paradigm is, is multiple dispatch. So this is what Julia is in, known for. And it's one of, uh, it's, it's basically it's a key feature. Um, a huge part of the language itself uh, is written in Julia, which is uh, quite nice. So if you know Julia, you can uh, look into, into the code itself and understand quite a lot of things which are happening there. Many things are written also in, in Lisp, if you, if you like Lisp. Um, it has optional typing, um, but uh, it basically does type inference uh, all the time. So it, it feels like uh, you don't really need to keep, take care about types uh, most of the time. Um, it figures them out. And it's a just-in-time uh, compiled language. It's also called uh, just ahead of time um, in, the, in the Julia community. Uh, it uses LLVM. So it's quite similar to what uh, Number does. Uh, it's just built into the language itself, so it's not like Lamba for for Python, where it's uh, it's something extra and it tries to analyze the Python code and then create some high performance code. It's basically the core compiler of, of Julia. Um, the performance uh, approaches that of statically type uh, statically compiled languages like C, and this is why it's so useful in in science uh, because you of course need high performance and you don't want to waste uh, CPU time and uh, resources. And it also has a list like macros and other metaprogramming features, which are really, really cool to ex express things which are otherwise very, very complicated. Uh, you can call C functions directly. So there is no, you don't need any wrappers or any spe uh, special API to call C libraries. And uh, you already know we have a lot of uh, really nice C libraries, which are sophisticated and which are also used in, in NumPy and other languages. Um, um, as a backend for number crunching, etc. So Juliet doesn't want to reinvent the wheel when there is something there, for example, these blasts and, and LAPAC uh, uh, things or MKL. Um, those can be directly uh, used in, in Julia to, to do the, the heavy uh, number lifting. And it also interfaces with other, other languages uh, very well. And there are packages for them like PyCall and RCall to, to call Python or, or R methods, etc. There's even uh, possibility to call Julia from Python, uh, etc. So, yeah, there's this interfacing. Uh, but what Julia tries to do is basically solve the two language problem where you have to write your code in uh, your, your prototype code in one language and do the heavy optimization in a different language. So, this is entirely possible in Julia. You write Julia code and it's usually uh, already high performance in the prototype phase. But I will come to that later. So, I would like to answer first the question, why Julia? So why, where I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it might be very useful for you if you have to often write your own algorithms or if you want to modify existing ones, uh, which in this case should also be written in Julia mostly, um, then it, Julia is, uh, is a really good choice for you because here you have access to everything. Um, if you want to write prototype code, which is usually as fast as, uh, as optimized code, then Julia is also a nice choice because as I said, uh, you usually, uh, uh, the compile itself takes care of all the stuff. So you just write the code and then it's uh, most of the time it's already um, um, very, very uh, runs quite fast. Of course, you can um, optimize in every language like manual, uh, like manual management of how data is arranged and how stuff are done uh, on the CPU or parallelized things, et cetera. 
Um, then, of course, one reason is to learn something different because Julia is a different language. It, uh, it feels different. Uh, it looks like Python. Uh, it also feels kind of like Python, but, uh, but the way you are structuring your program uh, and your, your logic is, is uh, different in Julia. Um, we will discover that later in, in, the, in the live demo. For example, in Python, you have these classes and Python is heavily object oriented. So you always have classes which have methods and in Julia, these, these are separate. Uh, kind of like in functional languages, where you have your functions separated from the data. And uh, yeah, this is how Julia does it. And uh, with its multiple dispatch feature, which we also will see later. And of course, if you want to use all your CPUs and GPUs uh, and even multiple machines in distributed computing, um, Julia has a lot of uh, built-in stuff and uh, a lot of uh, lightweight uh, libraries to, to do all this, uh, this kind of stuff, um, like MPI, if, if you know it, um, et cetera, are working extremely nicely. So distributed computing is, is definitely a thing in, with Julia. Now, of course, if you love working with Jupyter notebooks, uh, the Ju stands for Julia, as you may have already noticed in, in several other um, mentions of, of this Jupyter thing. Uh, there, is this, uh, there is a Julia kernel, so you can just open notebooks and launch a Julia kernel and then play it with it just like uh, with Python. And uh, of course, one of the things which I find always very, very nice is that the Julia community is full of scientists. So and in contrast to Python, where you have like a lot of different uh, backgrounds um, in the de developer side, um, in Julia, um, usually only scientists are interested or data scientists and, and other scientists. So it's, it's very cool when you go to the forums and ask for a how to optimize your function even even more and then it ends up uh, in discussions about papers and other algorithms to try out etc so it's not like um you are dealing with a community full of uh, whatever um backgrounds they have uh, in julia you mostly have uh, people who try to solve the same things than you are uh, as you are um okay then a small rant uh, or basically gripe about python itself so um, I am a big Python fan. Uh, don't take it uh, wrong. I, I write Python code for, I don't know, I started to use Python for, for system management and as a shell script replacement, I think 15 years ago or so. Then uh, when this NumPy thing went off uh, like eight years ago, then I really started to use it also for, for number crunching and, and stuff like this. And I wrote a lot of libraries and I spent a lot of time in, in um, in, um, in um, writing glue code and optimizing low level stuff uh, um, with Python uh, APIs. So yeah, I spend a whole load, uh, amount of time with Python in my life. And, but I think there is a fundamental issue which, uh, which still doesn't, uh, which still isn't really solved uh, yet. So Python is, is very popular. And, um, and the reasons why, why it's so popular is of course, because First, I think Python is already installed on many, many systems. I think this is a, this is a good reason because you just type Python and, and it's there, so you can just use it. And things you don't have to install, which are already there, are of course always uh, the the easiest solution, and um, it's it's very easy to use. So every student can make it uh, make can manage to quickly read a data set and create a plot within a few minutes or so from scratch, even if they they don't uh, even if they never coded um, anything else before. Uh, so that's a big uh, uh, pro for Python, of, of course, and this is also why it's, why it's so popular, because you can get, get uh, started very quickly. And then uh, there are many, many packages and libraries out there to do whatever comes to your mind. So there are like uh, blog uh, systems, static um, HTML generators, there are um, server client systems where you can have your own chat server, or you can do, of course, all, all kinds of um, scientific stuff is also there. Uh, on mass. Um, and um, of course, as I mentioned, NumPy made it really easy to, to crunch numbers. So I think this is probably one of the top reasons why, why Python has got so popular in science. But, and these are now the red points on the lower side, lower part of my, of my slide, um, uh, Python is not a language designed for scientific computing. So you always have this problem that uh, whenever you divert from these calling low level libraries, which are doing the heavy stuff, um you you are kind of slow you you, you create con control structures in python and you create your nice classes which hide these these things but whenever you, whenever you want something uh, whenever you want to do something which is which is really uh, high performance you have to go deep the hole and uh, you have to know a lot of different technologies to to achieve high performance so I have seen projects which uh, combines uh, techniques from from using numpy and the number 
together with Cyton and, and stuff like the, this, then some parts of them uh, should be run with PyPy, other parts uh, has uh, other classes written in, in, in C Python. And um, so it can be really complicated. And of course, the more technologies you use and the more thing, uh, APIs you, you write in different languages, um, the higher is the maintenance cost. And uh, um, people are coming and leaving in, in academics. So often when a new person comes and, and tries to, to maintain some things or fix bugs or, or extend it, and they face a lot of uh, glue code and, and things like this. So this can, uh, this can be very tedious. And this is basically um, the, the last point. Uh, developers spend a huge amount of time and effort to create and interface high-level performance libraries to Python. So there are all these projects which you all know, these, these NumPy, Pandas, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, H5Py, et cetera, et cetera, are quadrate from, from Jim, which is a huge library. Uh, a lot of, of development time went into that. And of course, many different implementations like this PyPy, then Iron Python, Cyton, Jyton. There are even more which, uh, which come up and, and, uh, and die. Um, after a few years, because they all do not, of course, can, cannot make uh, Python fast itself. So it's always this uh, this um, balance uh, keeping. So that's why I think uh, Julia is nice. But of course, you now have the question, are there even packages out there? Is this a new language? So yes, it's kind of a new language. It's um, it's uh, It's been around for almost 10 years, eight or nine years or so. Uh, but still, there are many, many packages out there. And as I said, the community is a, is a scientific community, which means that there are plenty of scientific packages available. So in contrast to Python, where you, of course, have millions of packages, but many, many packages do, does not have to do anything with, uh, with Python. And in Julia, you find a lot of stuff already. So there's this great site which you can explore, the Julia Observer. Um, there you can see what kind of packages are popular, what people are using. And uh, I just listed a very few packages which I which I love. So th there is this FluxJL. This is for machine learning. And uh, the nice thing is, as I said, uh, it's uh, written entirely in Julia. So this means that you can alter and and change every every kind of aspect uh, of this code. So it's not like when you're working with these TensorFlow-like systems where you have some kind of high-level Python code. And if you want to do something on the low-level side, then you have to rely on something which which connects to, to this uh, through a high level API, or you have to well, know a lot of things, internal things uh, of other languages like C or et cetera. So here, FuxJ is completely written in Julia. It has like 3000 GitHub stars and the last comment was just a few hours ago. I just saw, saw that, so it's very actively maintained. Then there's differential equations. Uh, I think this is one of the most sophisticated packages out there. Uh, it's for high performance uh, solvers and, and differential equations and also scientific uh, machine learning components. It's very fast and uh, very intuitive to use. Um, and it, it really uses all, all the, the features of Julia. Um, uh, yeah, you really have to try it if you, if you do it with such uh, th uh, stuff. Then of course, the iJulia to install the Julia kernel for Jupyter. So if you install this package, it will automatically uh, discover your Jupyter installation and place a kernel to, uh, into the, your kernel list. So you can just start uh, no Jupyter notebooks and work with them. Then there's Jump for modeling. It's a modeling language for mathematical uh, optimization. So whenever you have to optimize something, Jump is, is, is really great. Plots for plotting. It uh, even includes uh, Matplotlib as a backend, so you can use it. Um, you can call Matplotlib from that because, as I told you, um, you can call Python from Julia with basically no overhead. And then data frames, which is kind of like uh, pandas, so it's also inspired by our data frames. You know that pandas is also inspired by data frames, so this has been brought to, to Julia. There are a lot of R and Matlab users who uh, who created uh, Julia. So I mean, there are a lot of developers in Julia. Who has a background with, with MATLAB and R? So you will find some some things which are quite similar there. Uh, there's Zygote, which is a source-to-source -source, uh, automatic differentiation uh, system in Julia. It's really cool. It just uh, does automatic differentiation. You can throw in whatever function you want, and uh, and you can get the, the differentiation uh, functionalities there. And the Bayesian toolkit called BAT, um, which is a very nice package if you are interested in that. Okay, so these are just some, some packages to mention. Of course, there are tons of other packages out there. Um, I would like to show some benchmarks. So this is taken from the Julia uh, language website. Uh, I already showed this in my uh, Python talk last week. Um, and uh, what you can see here is uh, there are some benchmarks, uh, which you can see on the right side, this iteration pi sum and matrix multiply, matrix statistics, et cetera, et cetera. So all the code can be viewed um, on the Julia lang side. 
And uh, these are executed on a reference machine and then uh, the running time is observed and uh, sees the reference. So you take the running time for each benchmark and this is then one, which is on the, on the left, um, most left side, um, so it's C. And you can see that the spread in Julia and Luajit and Rust uh, and uh, even Go are quite, or Fortran of course, are, are very, very low. So most of the time uh, the performance is basically C or partly even better. And other languages uh, really struggle, so they are not really predictable in this sense. So, uh, absolutely, you can you can bring a Python code which looks like Python to reach C speeds, but uh, the amount of work you have to put in uh, to to do glue code to other libraries is is very humongous. So you can check the code how it's done here um, to do a fair comparison, but you can already see uh, the Julia um, um, performance is very close to C. And which is quite remarkable if you compare it to the syntax and uh, what you have to do um, compared to something like C or, or a system language, which is statically compiled, um, if you have written things like before. All right, so um, this is the first um, 60 minutes or so. Uh, let's head over to the live demo. Um, I create here a notebook. Let me make it bigger and full screen. I hope it's still visible if I go with full screen. Otherwise, please interrupt me. Um, yeah, so I will do a live session. This is a Julia session, um, which I record on this. So everything what I type here in the notebook um, will be saved. And after it, I will put it on the repository. So you can just download it and run through it, just like I did on the live demo. Um, of course, you can try to keep up, um, but I will use packages which you have to install, etc. So it's, it's a bit cumbersome. All right, just for good measure. Uh, I print out the version info. So as you can see, I can just uh, use it uh, like in, in a Python session. It's a Jupyter notebook. So I type in a command or a function call or whatever. I hit shift enter and it executes. I'm using here the latest version of Julia, which was released in April. Uh, it's version 1.6.1 on an Apple uh, M1 uh, MacBook. So that works. And um, yeah, I, uh, there's a package called benchmark tools. Um, which is uh, really easy to use and uh, it helps you to benchmark uh, functions if you want to know the time because if, of course if you are working with Julia you're always interested in the in the last uh, nanoseconds you can get out of your <laughs> of your stuff um, okay so um, I would like to first explain what's basically different or, or how the language works with just writing some functions so in uh, Julia the syntax is a bit different compared to Python so if I define a function I can do it like this. Um, so this, um, oops, I forget the end. Uh, so this is a, a very simple function, which just multiplies um, x by two. And uh, yeah, you call it like, like in Python. So <laughs> if, uh, call it two or if call it some float number, etc. cetera, uh, and it works. And you already see that there is this weird message which, which tells you f and then generic method uh, function with uh, one method. So in Julia, there is this concept of a function, which is uh, which is basically the name uh, of this uh, thing, and then the method, which is the implementation for a given set of parameters. And uh, this might be a bit confusing, um, but we will have a look at it um, later. Um, I would like to show you how to time a function. So if I use this macro B time, you remember maybe this uh, um, time it macro from from Python. It's basically the same. Um, all right. In uh, IPython, um, it's called this time time it macro. Here I can use B time, which is coming from this benchmark tools. And if I want to time uh, how fast the function is, I just type in B time and then the function call. And uh, yeah, now you see something very suspicious. It tells you that it uh, takes uh, basically <laughs> way less than one nanosecond. Uh, and this uh, cannot be true uh, because, uh, as you may have may remember from my talks, uh, a single operation takes around like a few nanoseconds uh, on, on a CPU. Uh, the problem here is that um, the compiler already figured out that uh, I'm calling it with a constant, so it calculated this value during compilation before I uh, before it even reached this macro to, to time it. Um, so it, it's extremely fast. Um, there is this trick which we can use. Um, this looks quite ugly, ugly but uh, what we basically do is we define um, a variable first, and then pass it via this reference. So I just want to show you the real time which it takes to multiply uh, two with two, and this takes around one, one, one and a half nanoseconds. If you remember the Python times, Python takes for this something like 40, 50 nanoseconds or so. So it's already factor 40 times uh, 
verse. And uh, yeah, we are now talking about primitive, primitive types. So uh, it uh, can get even worse in, in case of complex, more complex functions. Um, what I really like in Julia is that you can use uh, Unicode characters in, in, in a lot of uh, style matter, matter. So if, I, if you want to use something like alpha or beta, uh, you can just hit uh, backspace and beta. And if I now hit um, top, um, the, um, the character is, is displayed instead of this uh, command, which I just put in. And uh, you can even um, use something like uh, underscore uh, one or etc. So or, or, like a hat and then a plus, etc. So, uh, oops, backspace, of course, don't forget the backspace, uh, plus, etc. So, this uh, is, of course, a bit cumbersome to, to, to write, uh, but it's really nice in your formula. So, you can, this construct, you would probably write something like beta and then one uh, plus or so in Python. <laughs> of course, there you can also use uh, things like uh, uh, like Unicode characters nowadays, but I think it, it feels uh, much more uh, natural in, in, in Julia. Um, yeah, okay, so let's have a look at a real function like uh, um, this uh, silly example with slow mean. So it takes some, some kind of an array, let's call them an array. Um, and then we would like to sum the array and then divide by the length of the array. So as you can see, you recognize these. Um, things uh, from from Python sum. There is this sum. It's called length here, not len. Uh, but uh, this is how, how you work with the Julia. So you always have this function, and then you pass um, the um, the data into it. Um, in this case, um, I define the function a little bit differently because this is also a syntax you can use in Julia. So sometimes you have just really tiny functions like uh, f of x is equals two x. And you can also write it like this. In case of a multiplication, you can even omit uh, the multiplication sign. So, so just uh, write 2x, etc. So it is also you know, a way to, to save time or even make it look much more nicer than something like def or function and then fx and blah, blah, blah. OK, but it's not so important now. Let's uh, generate some data. Um, there is a function called ran, uh, which uh, makes some random numbers. Um, of course, uh, you can also do this now with the seed stuff to make it reproducible, et cetera, but this is now not part of this presentation. Uh, so here I just created an, um, a vector um, of floats uh, with uh, 10,000 elements. And uh, yeah, um, let's examine this um, type of X. And you can see that this is a vector now and it's holding float 64. So this is uh, basically the same when you do something like a NumPy array. Um, these elements are sitting next to each other in memory and uh, you can iterate through them really effectively. So this is not like in Python where you would create a list of, of, uh, of these numbers and everything is just an object and sitting somewhere in memory and pointing to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. No, this is really allocated in memory and uh, those are sitting next to each other. And uh, yeah, let's uh, time how slow our function is if we um, pass in, uh, so beta, um, slow me, and um, now I pass in x by reference. Just forget about this syntax. You don't need this if you if you work uh, with Julia. It's just needed for this uh, macro. It just means that it's uh, made, it's made sure that it's passed in before uh, before it's executed, so it doesn't mess around with our compilation uh, with our um, execution time. Okay, and you can see uh, it takes uh, zero point eight microseconds, which is uh, which is really good. Uh, I can tell you it's uh, it's fast. Um, but maybe you want to compare it to a reference implementation, uh, which is mean. There is also mean function in Julia. If I use that one, let's see if they are better. And uh, yeah, this is the surprising uh, thing. Uh, we wrote our function completely by ourselves um, without any kind of special syntax or whatever. We just uh, summed uh, the vector and then divided by the length. And as you can see, the uh, the reference implementation, which is part of the standard library, is uh, in the same order. So it's Basically, the same implementation too gives also the same result as you can see. So this is the cool thing: you just write your functions, and they are really fast. Um, so now I would like to talk about this multiple dispatch uh, thing. Uh, let me write multiple dispatch uh, dispatch. So what it is or how it works? Um, we have this random function, and uh, this is now a, a generic function, and you can see that it has seventy methods. So this is what I was talking about. Our f function had, uh, if you remember, when I go above, or, or the slow me fun function, for example, it, it is one function and it has one method. So it basically 
there is only a single method to this function, so you can say it's the same, but it's of course not the same technically. Uh, this means that for this rand, it's just a namespace and it holds 70 different implementations of this concept. Um, you can write a question mark in front of run um, and then hit shift enter and this will give you some examples how to use it. And you can, you can see that it has quite a few interesting ways to, to be used. So here it's called with something like a type and then a number. Here it's called with another type and here is a, a tuple is passed in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can have a look at the methods which it implements. So methods of uh, rand. This will list uh, for you all the different methods which are associated to this rand. So you can see that there are plenty of implementations. Um, there are implementations which uh, which take some some mask or some some whatever uh, abstract uh, random number generators, so global random number generators, uh, etc., etc. So depending on what you put in, so if I put in for example this uh, in thirty two and then let's uh, give it ten or so, it will then dispatch to the method which it's uh, which matches uh, the best. So it will pick the implementation which which holds, and there is of course somewhere an implementation which takes this data type and then generates uh, random numbers uh, from the range of the from the valid name range of these numbers. So if I just put in a rand uh, float sixty four, then I will get random sixty four numbers. In this case, it's uh, from zero to one. So the, the implementation may differ from type to type, and as you have seen above, you can also do something like uh, let's in 32 and then two, two or so. This will give you a matrix um, because it dispatch. So now the fu the function is called uh, and the method is called where the first one is is the type and the second one is the tuple, uh, and this will give you a matrix. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about methods. Um, methods, uh, just write methods. So there is our function of. Uh, of x equals 2x. So this is a very simple function. It just does uh, a multiplication by 2, as you can see. Um, there's a macro which you can use to inspect the code which is generated by, uh, by, by Julia, the LLVM code, uh, with a given um, value code. So if you call it, for example, with th uh, 23, uh, this is the code Julia generates. If you remember um, in the Python presentation how the code looked like when, when you do this uh, Python uh, thing where the bytecode is generated, you see that there are a lot of uh, calls and this is then interpreted by the Python interpreter. So there's a lot, a lot of, um, of overhead. In this case, Julia managed to, so just ignore these lines with, the, with these uh, semicolons, these are just comments. So in this case, Julia managed to make it a really, really tiny function. And this is basically just a single call on, on your CPU. And uh, this is a shift left because if you multiply with two and binary, it's basically just a left shift. Uh, and then it just returns your um, integer, uh, your integer 64 because it was called with an integer. Um, if I call it with another type, because of course, you, as you might have known, um, cannot do this bit shift trick. Um, here, so if I call it with a, with, a, with a float, you can see that it calls a float multiply, uh, but it's still a single machine uh, instruction in this case. So there is no things like search for a pointer, look, look for the type or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, this is also important um, if you look at the times. So if I go back to my function, let's uh, grab it again, yeah, here's the, definition. Um, if I call slow mean with, uh, or let's define a, some variables first, some array, um, let's call rand and then int 16 or so, just 100 of them. I put a semicolon so that the output is hidden. If I just time um, the execution when I call slow mean with this array, um, so time is just a built-in macro. So this is now not coming from, from benchmark tools. Um, I show it on purpose because uh, time only executes it once. So here you can see the exact times it took to calculate this number from these uh, 100 uh, random integers. And as you can see, it took uh, 30 milliseconds 
it did uh, 85,000 allocations. This means that it asked the computer 85,000 times to allocate memory at specific, uh, at, at whatever places, because it had to put something into memory. And it also used like five megabytes of memory. And you can see that there's a hint what happened, because you might be, I mean, you might ask you, why does it take so uh, many allocations to, uh, to generate 100 random numbers? Well, 99.44% of the time was compilation. This means that Julia has spent a lot of time in compiling a function for the given uh, type you have passed in. So it's, it has seen, okay, you're calling the slow mean function uh, with an array of uh, the type, uh, and this creates a vector of integer 16. So it uh, looked up, is there already a, a compiled function with this type? And if not, then it compiles. So it, it inspected the code. This is the code. It uh, called sum with your um, with your array, and then length with your array, etc. It even compiled sum maybe and length, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of them are pre-compiled, and then when it's finished, then it executed it, and this is then the result. If I call it again, so now I type again time slow mean array, then you can see that now it's really really fast. It's uh, it can, you cannot really trust it. You have to do the B time if the if the numbers are so low. But there was only one allocation because it uh, it created this one single thing and uh, 16 bytes. So it basically costs nothing to call it again. So whenever I call it again and the types are there, it's it's really fast. But when I now, for example, create another array, let's call it array two with a type which I have not used before, maybe in 64 or so. And let's copy paste again. Sorry for copy pasting. But I'm maybe running out of time a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, this should be array two. So the first call is again, 3,400 locations. Now, not that much as before, because some of the stuff may have already be compiled uh, in meanwhile. And the, the second call will be then um, the high performance call because the uh, function is already compiled. So this is what you have to keep in mind. It's the same basically with number. Um, we had this question about why don't compile everything with number. Well, sometimes it doesn't make sense if you have like 10,000 functions and you only call call all of them once, uh, then it might be not a good idea. But of course, if you have 10,000 functions and uh, you call all of them once, but one function is called 10 trillion times or so, then of course it could, could make sense. Um, so yeah. Okay, so let's uh, skip over to something. I told you that Julia is... Uh, mostly written or a large part of Julia is written in Julia. So I wanted to show you this, uh, this cool trick which you can do to explore things. So if you launch your Julia um, interpreter, it's, uh, it's basically working the same like Python. You type in IPython or Python or whatever uh, Python uh, interpreter you use. Here in Julia, you just type in Julia and you are here. And inside this, and then you can, you can play, play around with, uh, with things and you can get sort of this read, emulate, um, print, loop. This, this is what, what REPL means, if you're asking yourself what, what the hell I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so you can use it like this. You can assign variables. You can um, you can use them, et cetera, et cetera, just like in a notebook. And uh, there's this macro, which I really like. Uh, this is this edit macro. And there you can, for example, if I want to uh, know um, what is called when I when I type in sign of 23.5, so this is basically sign called with a, with a float, and hit enter, uh, it immediately opens the editor of, uh, in this case, it's Emacs. So if you use VS Code or whatever, you can set it to whatever editor you like. Um, it will pick the one, um, the default one. And you can see that it jumped into this uh, trick.jl, which is probably trigonometry.jl. Tri 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 and um, here is the implementation of the sign function, which uh, takes an X. And here you can see that now we have a parametric function. So it basically means that. Uh, um, it can also use the type inside this body. So this is a bit more advanced stuff, but uh, yeah, essentially the most important thing is that this is the, the, the function uh, or basically the function which will um, dispatch on the float um, 30, uh, 64. So this is what, what's called here. Okay, so nice way to explore things. And of course it also works with your own code. So if you have checked out your if you're working on a package, in, on a Julia package, et cetera, and you just want to have, have a look at the code or you're using some other packages from other people, it will open it. So it not, doesn't, uh, it's not only the, the Julia standard library, it will find the file uh, where it's calling from. So yeah, cool feature. I highly recommend to use it. 
So let's get back to the, where is my, did I close my, sorry, there we go. Oh, okay, it's loading. So, and now uh, I want to make a somewhat real world example. So it's just to demonstrate some functionalities with a little bit of, of real world uh, example. It's, um, it's something I already showed in uh, two years ago. In the last school, um, it's a tiny temperature library, but it's even tinier this time because I uh, last time it uh, it uh, took a lot of time to explain it. So, anyways, uh, this example is taken from it's not from from myself, so it's uh, it's inspired by uh, put it in inspired by Eric um, Enheim, and I will also put in the link to the original blog post. So he made this beautiful example to compare how things are done in Python or could be done in Python and how these are done in Julia instead so that you can see the differences of, of programming style. Um, but um, yeah, let's start out so, so that you can get a feeling. So imagine you want to write a tiny library which can convert temperatures from one to, um, to from, from Celsius to, to Fahrenheit or Celsius to Kelvin or whatever. So we make it a bit simpler. Last time I, I made it a bit too complicated to explain. So. Uh, it's a CS um, value n. So this is what you're working with usually in Julia. This is called a a type. Basically, uh, it's a, it's a struct in C. If you if you know C, uh, it has a name and it has some fields. In this case, it has only one field, but you could also define different fields here, like a, b, etc. You could even define uh, a specific uh, type if you wanted. Um, Otherwise, it will just uh, be of type any. But for, for now, we, we go with this and uh, see what happens. And to instantiate uh, one, uh, so in principle, it's something like a class in Python, if you're, if you're used to classes. And uh, it doesn't have any methods attached to it. So it just contains data. So if I type in Celsius uh, 10 or so, then I get back such an object. So you can just assign it to a variable like this, Celsius. And this is the Celsius and the T value. Uh, oops, I overwrote. Oops, sorry, says it's done like this. And T value points to that, so you can just access these fields. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, it currently doesn't have any type, so this value gets inferred by uh, by Julia. So if we have a look at type of T value, you can see that it's an int sixty four because I passed in a number. If I call it with um, with a float or force it with, with a float literal, um, it will then let's call it t uh, underscore two for good measure, like this, and then t underscore two um, type of dot value is then float sixty four. Um, so this means that uh, it will also accept something like hello <laughs> as a text string. But of course, maybe you don't want to, to do this. So uh, what you can do is you can restrict it um, to a specific type. So in this case, I wrote struct Celsius and I want to have a parameter type like this. And this should be a subtype of real. So there is this concept of subtyping in Julia, but it's not a subtyping like subclassing in Python. It's really just a type hierarchy. So you have this real and the real, um, um, is the, these are basically real numbers. And under these real numbers are uh, all the other data types uh, which are which are real, and those uh, can be addressed like this. So this means that I want to restrain uh, Celsius to be a subtype of real. If I execute it, however, I will get an error because during runtime you are not allowed to redefine um, constants. So, uh, so this is a, a type definition. Um, I quickly restart the kernel, and if I now um, create this new type and use it. Just give it a few seconds until the kernel restarts. And I type, for example, sales extend, and it still works. And uh, you can see that it now also prints the type parameter here. If I put in a float like this, then it will dispatch to this. So you can use this information um, um, inside other um, methods and functions where you are using it. Um, OK. And yeah, of course, Celsius, um, oops. Do stop more often. Hello will now give you um, a method error because it doesn't find any method of the function Celsius. It's basically a function uh, with the type string passed into it. And uh, yeah, it also gives you the closest candidate, which is, which is this one where t has to be a subtype of real. So this is this always gives you a hint 
of uh, whatever works. And then, of course, if you want to use, for example, complex numbers like this, complex numbers are three, so this doesn't work either. So if you want to, um, yeah, here's just how it's done like this. Okay, so, um, all right, how much time do we have? 20 minutes. I will quickly do a recap. Um, let's make it a bit more interesting. So I restart the kernel now because I will now redefine our types and I will make it a bit more cooler because we also want to um, introduce our own type hierarchy. It will be a very tiny one, uh, but I define an abstract type temperature and this uh, abstract means that I cannot create instances of, of it. It's just uh, an abstract thing uh, which I can subtype of. So I would like to, to say that in my library there's this thing called temperature. And then I can go ahead and uh, define my temperatures. For example, there's this uh, temperature um, type Celsius, and it should be a subclass of temperature. And it has a value, which is in this case, for example, a float 64, because I want uh, to have it like this. Okay, let's define another one, struct uh, Kelvin um, temperature like this value, also float 64. And so I've now defined two. Uh, I will skip now Fahrenheit and whatever. <laughs> Um, just to save some time. Uh, okay, and now we would like to, for example, convert from one type to another. So if I type convert uh, and hit uh, shift enter, you can see that there is already a function called convert, convert and it has 187 methods. Uh, so it would be cool if you just extend it. So why we don't want to do something like temperature convert, etc. because we can use this function name. People already know it. So maybe just they will just try it. And if it works, then it's intuitive, right? So if you want to do this, um, first import, uh, import this from base. So this is the base um, um, module of Julia. And I would like to import the convert function like this. And now we can write convert. And for convert, I would like to give the type Kelvin, for example. And then the second parameter is, uh, I call it T, and I say that it has to be of type Celsius. Um, and uh, the conversion function will create then a, so uh, here I will convert a Celsius to a Kelvin type. And then of course I call the constructor of Kelvin like this. And uh, this means that the past in temperature, which is this one, I can take its value and just add 273.15 to it. And this will create my, uh, my Celsius, uh, my um, my Kelvin out of Celsius. Sorry, and the same for Celsius to Kelvin. I do uh, Celsius and then subtract it. So, and this is basically what I meant with uh, in Julia. You have your types and your methods uncoupled. So in Python, you probably will probably would like to do something like you create a class, um, Celsius, like uh, class and Celsius, blah, 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 etc. Then it takes uh, some, some kind of um, init self value to initialize. I don't do it like this. I told you it's, it's better to work in vectorized things, but uh, uh, self value equals value or so. And then you have some method like um, um, to Kelvin or so. And then there is this implementation where you implement how to um, convert the self value value to a Kelvin thing. So this one is completely attached to the Celsius, but this means that you always have to modify Celsius and also the class uh, Kelvin if you want to add new things. Here in Julio, it's completely separated. So again, other people can go there and define functions and um, for their own um, um, temperature. So if someone com comes there and want to define a new temperature, like Fahrenheit, um, they don't even have to touch your code. They can just import it and, the, and uh, add a new method to this convert and then it will work magically. So this is really cool. Okay, this is, I write here that it's just a Python example. Okay, so 15 minutes le left. Let's see if, if we work this out. Um, I would like to define one more method so we can import um, from, for example, let, let's say I want to multiply temperatures for whatever reason. Uh, I can import the star, uh, the asterisk, and this is basically the multiplication in Julia. And I can define my own multiplication method when, where, I, where it takes a number and some kind of a type, which is a subtype of temperature. So now I've added 
uh, if I execute this, I will add the method to our multiplication, which is also just a function. So if I type in a star and hit enter, you will see that it's multiplication and it is a, had, uh, this is the function name and it has 328 different methods. So it has a method to multiply, for example, float with an integer or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is different. Uh, and here I tell uh, Julia to add the new method, which takes in a number and a temperature. So Y is of type T and T is a subtype of temperature. And the way to calculate the, the, uh, the result is to take the same type, which was passed in. So this can be currently um, Kelvin or Celsius, and then take the number the user passed in, uh, which is called X, and then multiply it by Y dot value. So if I execute this, uh, I can do something like 10 times and then, for example, uh, 10 Kelvin or so. And this gives you 100 Kelvin. Um, all right. And then uh, another thing which, which is also nice, uh, we can uh, exploit the feature that uh, numbers can be written like this uh, by defining two constants. And here I use the degree, um, which you can do like this, degree and then hit top. So a constant uh, degree Celsius is uh, Celsius 1 and then Kelvin one. And uh, this is really funny because now you can also modify how it's displayed. So if you have seen about, above, above um, if I do something like Kelvin 10, it's displayed like this, but uh, I can import the show method from base, from, uh, from Julia base, uh, the, the function, and add two new methods to it to tell Julia how to display Celsius and Kelvin. And uh, in this case, I would like to display the value itself and then degree Celsius in, instead of writing out it out. So if I launch this and do something like Celsius, etc., then it's displayed like this. Um, okay, and then of course our conversion. Um, we want to convert um, to Kelvin, for example, um, 36 degree Celsius, and uh, I've not defined it. Why? Oh, I forgot to um, execute this line, so our constants were not defined. So there we go. Um, here we converted 36 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. Okay, so 30 minutes left. That's, uh, I think, okay. Um, I would like to show you how to interface now with other stuff. So if I, as, uh, as I've um, told you before, you can define your own types, your type characters, et cetera, and then just reuse this stuff. So in Convert, we just added our methods. Um, you can also do it, for example, with random numbers. Um, let's uh, pick something, random temperatures. Um, there is this rent function, which you which you know, um, and uh, you have seen that uh, it can take, for example, a, a type, and then it will generate a, a random thing a given a, um, of this type. So we can import this um, random thing just to have an access to this uh, rent function like this, and add our own uh, method to it. Uh, abstract RNG. Sorry, this will be now a little bit cryptic because we have to override. Uh, we, we have to add a, a method to a specific function, uh, to, to a specific um, function to this run. Um, and this is called, so this is when it's called with the sampler type. Now we say that it should be Kelvin. And this is then Kelvin and then pass in a random number. So like this. So if I now call random with our um, own type, it will generate a new random Kelvin. So we can, for example, tell it that it's, it should generate numbers which are multiplied by 5,000 or so, then I get this, this uh, funny number. So what I, this can be um, complicated stuff also. You can do all kinds of stuff there. Uh, but the cool thing is that now I, and that, that now I have defined this special method, which uh, really is uh, dispatching on the sampler type Kelvin. I can use all the methods which are defined in run. Uh, so if I pass in an extra number, it knows how to sample from this Kelvin. So it, it can create a one hundred element vector or even a matrix of, of Kelvins, um, as you can see. And this is something which is, which is really fast now. So this is not something like it is creating huge objects in Python, et cetera, what you have seen before. So if I use using benchmark tools, this is this um, package to time your code in Julia and execute B time and then see how long it takes to, um, for example, generate a matrix with one minute uh, temperature entries. Um, it will be really fast um, while it's executing. I type further. 
it's uh, running quite a lot of time. So yeah, you can see two allocations uh, and uh, 3.7 milliseconds to create this. Um, this is the memory overhead. And uh, also if you just multiply, for example, um, let's multiply here, 10,000 Kevin entries with two, because we implemented this um, multiplication method, we can also use this. This will be really fast. So 38 microseconds. Um, yeah, this is um, very close to, it's basically machine speed. So you cannot do it really uh, faster. Okay, the last 10 minutes, um, I would like to show you just a very quick example. I'm sorry for copy pasting it, but for example, if you're working with PNTs, um, which I do with neutrino telescopes, um, you could, for example, define your, your um, hit type. So this is just a very simple one. There is no type hierarchy, it's just a simple type. It has a DOM ID, a digital optical module ID, a PMT ID, a time over threshold, which is our signal, and then the time. You could do something if you're if you're doing some Monte Carlo simulations. Um, you could add a method to a uh, stat space sample function. And uh, I'm now just copy pasting it. Um, this one doesn't, doesn't, isn't needed anymore. So there's this run function. I add this, uh, uh, sorry, I don't add a new method to the sample. I'm just using sample. Uh, I add the new method to the run function again for the sampler type ducket. So um, if you recall, um, before we added a new one for, for Kevin, here we are adding a new ducket. And then for example, we are picking the DOM ID from a predefined list or so. It, I just made this example up just to, to show you how you could alter the, the functionalities of run. And then it should pick a PMT ID, which is in a valid range. So we always have like, well, that's too much. We have uh, 31 PMT. So let's take pick a number between zero and 13. Uh, including 0 and 13, and the TOT should be something between 0 and 221, uh, 22, uh, 55, sorry, then the time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it returns then uh, the, the value. So if I hit now enter, oops, there was extra character. So now I can um, create my ducket like this, and this will create um, a random ducket. Uh, don't be confused about this 0 extra representations. This is because I Created, uh, I um, this type is a unsigned type, and unsigned types in Julia are always written as hex uh, uh, if you if you print them. So we could add our show method if you don't like it and and alter it. But the important thing is it still works with all the other methods. So I can generate 100 duck hits and blah blah blah. I can do my Monte Carlo simulations, etc. Okay. So last word, because of course if you're a scientist, uh, you also would like to do some plots. Uh, so I just wanted to do. A very quick uh, intro uh, that it's uh, easy to use. So there is this plotting library called plots. Um, so with using plots, you import this and uh, you can, for example, let's take n equals 100 and then plot, for example, 100 uh, random numbers like this. Um, yeah, this will call the plots with the default backend, which is a gr plot. Um, there is your plot. Uh, the first call takes a bit of time, a few seconds, because it has to compile um, the function first. So it was not called before. Uh, but if I launch it again, and consecutive calls are, are fast, so don't be scared of it. Um, this is something Julia sometimes feels a little bit cold when you start it. So it has to pre-compile things. But once the session is running, it's it's fast. This is because it has to compile that stuff. Um, and uh, you may have noticed that. Uh, I put in now something like 1 to 100, which generates, uh, this is a range object. Um, in NumPy, you can do something like lint space, etc. cetera. Uh, in Julia, there's also this range. So you can also uh, use this one, but you have to explicitly tell them how, how to use it. So range is really cool because it is a generic function and it has a lot of different methods. So if I, if I for example, do uh, 1 to 10 and then uh, length uh, 100, then I get this, Oh, let me make it a bit, um, let's collect it so that you can see the actual values um, which are coming up. So these are the actual values, but I can also tell him to do a step. So this is basically uh, this arrange versus um, a lint space, etc. So in NumPy, you have different functions. In Julia, you can have the same function name and just pass in different things or different keywords, etc. And it, it will dispatch on them. Okay, let's do a complicated plot like this. Here yeah, I plotted a sine, cosine, and a five, five sync uh, function. And of course, histograms, etc. everything works. Um, so before, um, I have not called histograms, so it took like a second to display. Consecutive calls are really, really fast. 
etc. And uh, yeah, so everything is there to make plots. Um, there are even uh, PGF plots. Um, there is this PGF plots uh, library, which I love. This is what I use everywhere. Um, you know, you may have seen a Max really cool presentation at the end of the Matlab, uh, Matplotlib session where he shows how to create publication quality LaTeX, uh, LaTeX uh, plots. Um, this can be done with Julia using the PGF plots library. Okay, and last but not least, um, apropos Python, I told you that you can use Python from Julia and vice versa. So let's uh, have just a few cells of, uh, on it. Uh, apropos Python, uh, there's a package called PyCall. Um, I imported it, and uh, with PyCall you can import Python packages. <laughs> so let's do something funny. Um, np equals py import numpy. So if I call this function py import, um, it will import for me numpy. So it found this conda installation uh, and this py, uh, numpy pa package. You can also configure py, py code to point at a specific environment in conda, etc. So you can switch uh, also during runtime between different um, um, Python installations. Uh, but the funny thing is now I can use it. So for example, you know this i function maybe from my um, NumPy presentation. If I call it, uh, it will give you real Julia things back. So here's a five uh, by five matrix with ones on the diagonal. So this is really a NumPy fun uh, method, which I'm calling here a function. And I can mix it with, uh, with Julia stuff. So as I said, it's returning Julia uh, things. So um, it works like if I do, for example, um, this is the random function from Julia, and I just multiplied it with a with a matrix from coming from directly from NumPy. I can even if I don't like the num uh, the Julia range function for whatever reason, I can use the lin space. It even does step completion here, of course, uh, like this. And uh, yeah, this is a real Julia vector, which is which has a, a nice uh, memory layout, and you can work with it um, really in a high performance way. All right, so. That's it. Um, I would like to go back to my very first Julia introduction just to have something to show while we ask, uh, answer some questions. So I would like to head over to Thomas and ask if there are some confusions, questions, or whatever. <laughs> Many thanks for your for your time. Thank you, Tamar, for his um, short but dense introduction. <laughs> oh, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. Um, there are a few questions. Um, where did the name Julia come from? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I always come back and read something about it, but it's, uh, it's uh, I don't, I, I can't answer it right now, sorry. Uh, I always mix uh, different myths and legends and whatever. Uh, some people say it's coming from this Julia set. Other people say there was this girl. Uh, so <laughs> whatever. Okay. Um, it is. Yeah, I think there is a section about it on, on Wikipedia. But uh, yeah, it's I think the best resource for now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, someone was asking about the a comparison between the plotting in Julia and Matplotlib. Can you okay. say a few words? A few words. So. Because you can use, uh, so there's also, so plots is something which is very high level uh, as uh, CFC, um, or, or as, as I've mentioned. So you can switch the, the backend of plots to use something else. So you can basically also use matplotlib as a plotting backend for plots. Uh, but there is also pi, uh, pi plot. Um, and if you import this, this will give me a warning because there is only plots uh, in the memory which has similar names. So there's PyPlot, and this is a direct wrapper to, to Matplotlib. So if you're used to Matplotlib and if you like it, you can just use PyPlot, and this will use the Matplotlib uh, plotlib, uh, lib, uh, backend. Uh, so if I now do something like plot, and then uh, I think I still have something like access in memory, I hope so. Um, course, uh, access like this. Premature, let me do another. X is not defined. Okay, let's define it. X is equals one to hundred. This will be very ugly, but maybe you recognize this. Uh, this is really matplotlib. So the line color and the style, etc. So this is now coming from matplotlib, and then you can alter all the stuff here. It uh, the syntax is a bit different, but uh, there is of course documentation, uh, and you can pass all kinds of uh, of uh, configuration options to make your plots look like in matplotlib. 
yeah. So how does it compare? I prefer GR plots uh, for for quick things and uh, PGF plots for for publications. That's uh, um, yeah, but you can use whatever you want. There are also 3D um, plotting libraries like Maki, etc., which are which are um, GPU accelerated. So yeah, there is there are a lot of things out there. Also GNU plot if if you like that. Okay. Okay, thanks. And maybe last question, um, is there a Dask-like equivalent in Julia? Uh, sorry again? An, equi an equivalent to Dask. Equivalent to, to Dask? To work, to work on a cluster. Mm, well, that's a good question. I'm not sure if there is something similar to that. I think there you have to combine a bit more things together to get something like that. Yeah, that I'm no expert of, to be honest. And Okay, another question that just uh, uh, appeared. Uh, how would you compare Julia and Python and in which situation would you prefer Python or Julia? Oh, that's a good question. I think you are asking the wrong guy because I, <laughs> I think that you should always prefer Julia for science. Uh, I would not use Julia if I do a quick project where I do where performance doesn't matter, like uh, something like uh, a quick and dirty a server or or some maybe text processing is a bit more natural in, in, in Python. I'm not sure. For science, I would definitely say that you can do everything in Julia and uh, there is no reason to 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 do it in, in Python unless you really need something quickly and it's it's completely there. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you want to do machine learning really quickly, then just use something uh, which is there if you rely on TensorFlow or you have something which is already built upon TensorFlow or etc. Then use that. So don't write your whole the whole analysis uh, chain from someone else uh, in a new language etc. But if you want to explore things and you are really starting from from scratch and uh, from from scratch, then I think Julia is, uh, is, uh, is a really good choice. And I think that this will shift over the next few years when people realize that it uh, that Julia has way less maintenance overhead and, and it's way easier to use also, as I said, um, you can alter all kinds of things uh, down the line. So when you're, you're working with Flux, you can really um, um, optimize your machine learning stuff until, uh, until the very last point of the chain, instead of calling things which are rigid and, and not, uh, not fixable. This is really compared to like NumPy, if you if you use these numpy operations like summing them things up, calculating the mean, multiplying things together, this is really cool. But when you need something like uh, multiply these two matrices, but not the values which are on the diagonal, and uh, do something on the upper half or on a, it's maybe a lower triangular matrix, so there might be a better way to do it, do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This all happens in Julia due to multiple dispatch, and you have a lot of leverage and all this stuff. So it's it's not like a toolbox. So I, I, I would compare NumPy and Python things to, to a Lego style. And uh, Julia is basically, you have all the materials and you can you can do it yourself, everything. So this is how I would see it. Okay, thanks. Well, this is the end of this uh, introduction to Julia. Thank you very much again. Um, we basically don't have a break uh, for the next lecture. I will just close the live and restart it in, in a few minutes. And the next one is about uh, chemtrinet uh, data analysis. See you, see you in a minute.